Oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister couldn't answer whether the government negotiated the right to manufacture vaccines here in Canada. At committee, the head of the Public Health Agency suggested the government did not do that. So let's try this one more time, Mr. Speaker. Did the government negotiate the right to manufacture vaccines here in Canada? Yes or no? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And when this pandemic began, we all know that Canada had no biomanufacturing capacity suitable for a COVID-19 vaccine. Underinvestment in vaccine production capacity began decades ago, in the previous century. And we realized right away that we had to invest in our flexible domestic production. We had to ramp up our facilities, which is exactly what we did. But rest assured that when a vaccine is ready and approved, we will be one of the first countries to get those doses from the manufacturers of Canada's vaccine portfolio. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, you know there's no plan when the Minister of Health is here and not answering questions on a pandemic, Mr. Speaker. It's rubbish. In fact, rubbish was the word one of the experts used to provide on the government's answer to vaccine manufacturing. The National Research Council has a facility in Montreal that could manufacture millions of vaccines. We know that most of the world will receive the vaccine before Canadians do. Why did the Prime Minister negotiate deals to put Canada at the back of the line for COVID-19 vaccines? Be before we go to the Minister of Health, order, order. Before we go to the Minister of Health, I want to remind the honourable members that we are not to state whether someone is present or not. Uh, it's just part of the rules, and I am here to enforce them. The Honourable Minister of Health. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I think the member opposite uh, it fails to understand that, in fact, Canada is the best country positioned with the most doses of vaccine per capita anywhere else in the world. In fact, we have seven leading candidates that we have procured, Mr. Speaker, three of them under regulatory review. In fact, you know what, Mr. Speaker, we're the only country that is reviewing all three leading candidates right now as we speak. In fact, Moderna, if you won't listen to me, how about the president of Moderna, who said, Canada is certainly one of the first countries to have an agreement with us and will be serviced very quickly. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the robust portfolio they talk about ensures that Canadians will have the most vaccines in 2023, Mr. Speaker. Last night, the Minister for Intergovernmental Affairs gave three answers to the same question about when vaccines would be arriving. First, it was January. Then he said sometime in 2021. Then it was the first quarter, Mr. Speaker. In one interview, Canadians saw that the Liberal government has no plan when it comes to a vaccine rollout for Canadians. The question to the Minister is simple. On what exact date will the vaccine for Canadians be here? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite is trying to confuse Canadians right now as we speak. In fact, what we know here on this side of the House is that we have worked incredibly hard as a government to procure seven leading vaccines, Mr. Speaker, more per capita than any other country in the world. In fact, Mr. Speaker, three of them under regulatory review right now, the only country in the world to have those three simultaneously reviewed. I have to say, Mr. Speaker, the future looks bright for Canadians. I am proud of the work of my colleagues to make this happen. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Monsieur le Président des Milliers. Mr. Speaker, thousands of businesses have had to close their doors during the pandemic. Many Canadians have lost their jobs. When we heard the good news about a vaccine, Canadians saw a glimmer of hope once again. But this government has no plan for the vaccine, and we're the last in line to receive the vaccines. My question is simple. When will Canadians be getting these vaccines? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada is one of the best countries positioned to receive the most doses per capita than any other country in the world. In fact, Mr. Speaker, three of the leading candidates under regulatory review right now, the only country in the world to be reviewing the three leading candidates. I have to say, Mr. Speaker, that when the president of Moderna, one of those three candidates, says Canada is certainly one of the first countries to have an agreement with us and will be serviced very quickly, that should give Canadians confidence that we're doing the job and we'll get it done. Le honorable chef de l'opposition.
the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. To review, last to receive, Mr. Speaker. That's the record of this government. Le 23 octobre, les ministres. On the 23rd of October, the Ontario and Quebec health ministers wrote a letter to the federal government. A letter about vaccine planning, and they didn't get an answer. We know that more than 2 billion people throughout the world will be getting their vaccines before we do. Why is Canada going to receive a vaccine after many other countries do? The Honourable Government House Leader Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition seems to be going fishing here. And I think he seems to be trying to lead Canadians astray. That is not appropriate. We know that Canada has agreements with seven vaccine production companies, the best vaccine portfolio in the world, and the greatest number of doses, Mr. Speaker. We will be there. When the vaccine is ready, Canada will be ready. The Honourable Member for La Prairie, Mr. Speaker, while the government of Quebec is trying to plan its vaccination campaign against COVID, it's only this week in November that this government is telling us that we're not going to get a vaccine before or after the holidays. It's absolute pandemonium, Mr. Speaker. Quebecers have been making sacrifices for eight months. They've been waiting impatiently for the vaccine. They deserve to know when exactly will they get the vaccine? March, July, 2028, when? The Honourable Minister. Always said that we will work incredibly hard to make sure all Canadians have access to the vaccine, and that's exactly what we've done on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. We focus on what matters, which is making sure that we have well-placed purchase agreements with, with manufacturers of leading candidates, Mr. Speaker. Three of those leading candidates under regulatory review, the first in the world to have those candidates, all three simultaneously, seeking approval at Health Canada. As the member opposite notes, I work closely with Minister Dubé in Quebec. I will continue to ensure that he's fully informed and participates in the plan to, uh, to uh, deploy vaccines to Canada. De la Prairie. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, we know that there's a saying that's saying governing means planning. Well, this government doesn't seem to know that. The federal government should have closed the borders quickly to stop the outbreak. It didn't do so. It should have approved rapid testing to prevent a second wave. It didn't do that either. It should have increased health transfers to help Quebec take care of the sick. It didn't do that. And now it should have obtained priority vaccines, but it didn't do that either. It's a monumental failure. A huge mistake. Could this government at least have the decency to answer the government of Quebec? When will we be getting a vaccine? <laughs> The Honourable Government House Leader. Well, I think the F that my colleague is implying we should get as a grade it stands for fantastic because we negotiated vaccine purchases. We're talking with the Premier of Quebec. In fact, the Prime Minister will be talking to the Premier of Quebec this evening. And as we said earlier, we have agreements with the seven companies producing vaccines. And those are being reviewed by Health Canada. And Mr. Speaker, when the vaccines are ready, Canada will be ready. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. The Prime Minister blamed the Conservatives for the fact that Canada can no longer produce vaccines. Well, it's not a surprise for anyone that Conservatives let down Canadians when it came to health care. But what does the Prime Minister have to say about 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, and this year? Why is the Prime Minister making Canadians wait for a vaccine? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And in contrast to the other side, our government has been aggressively pursuing new biomanufacturing capacity. We've taken serious action since well before the pandemic. In our first mandate, we restored the ability for ICED to invest in life sciences that had been pulled back by the previous government. And we've only accelerated our investments significantly since the pandemic with major investments uh, in our manufacturing capacity, uh, Medicago, the National Research Centre in Montreal. We're on our way to building a beautiful portfolio of vaccines. It will be delivered when Health Canada says as they're ready. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're in the middle of the second wave of COVID-19. People are scared. But vaccine announcements gave people a bit of hope. But now, this Liberal government has not shared a plan with Canadians. What is the plan for delivering the vaccines? When will we receive the vaccines? What is the plan? 
The Honorable Minister of Health. Have the best portfolio in the world, more doses per capita than any other country, three of the leading vaccines under regulatory review, expedited, working in partnership with the Americans and the European Union so that we can share our data and approve those vaccines even more quickly. We have a plan, Mr. Speaker. We're working with provinces and territories at all levels. And let me remind the member opposite, they are actually experts at immunization. Every single year, they deploy immunization, as is their health care responsibilities. We'll be there to support them, including by providing the vaccines, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi de Fior. Mr. Speaker, this government is creating a, spo a smoke screen with its white paper. For five years, the Liberals have been talking about reforming official languages. But now, when it's time to act, we see that they haven't done anything, they haven't prepared anything. What have they been doing for the last five years in this file? They're flying by the seat of their pants, Mr. Speaker. A motion was unanimously adopted that asked the minister to table a bill on modernizing the Official Languages Act. We want to know whether the minister will be respecting that motion. The Honorable Minister of Official Languages. Mr. Speaker, my colleague has asked what we've done over the, five last, over the last five years. Well, we repaired all the mistakes made in this file by the Harper government. That's what we've been doing. And when I look at the current conservative strategy, they're cre clearly trying to steal votes from the bloc. This is all about political maneuvering. It actually has very little to do with their real values on official languages, and it would never show itself in action. They would never take action on the file. Even the NDP, with the member for New Westminster Burnaby, recently stated that whenever the Conservatives are in government, Frankfurt rights are violated. The Honourable Member for Make Antique Lérable. Mr. Speaker, there, is, there are clearly divisions in the Liberal caucus. Some Liberal members, such as the member for Mont Royal or Saint Laurent, state that Bill 101 isn't necessarily a good idea or, and that the decline of French is not actually happening. Now the Liberals are trying to postpone modernizing the Act. And now, now that they're being pressured, they're brandishing a white flag. Oh, I'm sorry, a white paper. Why? When is this government actually going to table a bill before this Christmas? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, there aren't going to be any surprises here. In the throne speech, we stated that we would be tabling a bill on modernizing the Official Languages Act. And we also have a goal to more broadly undertake linguistic reform because French is a minority language in the country and we are the first government to recognize that the French language is a minority in the country and requires further protection and promotion. And we will be doing that not only in Canada, as we have historically done, for 50 years, but specifically in Quebec, and that's what we're going to do. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, the Minister can't even tell us when this legislation will be tabled. And now she's trying to preach to all the other parties in the House. I would ask her to show us that she's really going to do something to protect French. The Government of Quebec and all parties in the National Assembly unanimously asked that the federal government respect Bill 101 in federally regulated businesses. So I'm giving the minister a chance to say here and now very clearly in this house so that all Quebecers hear her. I would like her to say that she agrees with this call from the government of Quebec. Does she agree? Yes or no? The honorable minister. Mr. Speaker, as a government, we clearly understand the importance of the legacy of Bill 101. As an MP in my riding, when I meet with new arrivals to Canada whose children speak to us in French, it's remarkable to see the secondary schools in my riding with people from all over the world speaking French, the common language of Quebec. In the circumstances, we will continue to work with the government of Quebec, of course, and my counterpart in Quebec, Simon Lombaret, we will continue to work with them and we will be tabling a bill we will, as we said, proceed with language reform. Greenos Hill. Mr. Speaker, there's a difference between signing a contract for a vaccine and when the average person in Canada will actually receive it. Yes. So this week, we've heard from the Americans that in December, they're going to vaccinate 20 million of their, their people, and in January, 30 million, which means by the middle of January, the Americans will have vaccinated the equivalent of the entirety of the population of Canada. So, I know that the minister will say she has a big portfolio. 
will 33 plus million Canadians be vaccinated at the same time that 33 plus million Americans are? The Honourable Minister for Health. Speaker, the member opposite knows that, in fact, we do have the biggest portfolio per capita in the world, and we do have a plan with the provinces and territories, and that we are working incredibly hard, including with our American and our European counterparts, to make sure that we're able to deliver vaccines to Canadians. We're going to stay focused on that goal, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to sow division amongst Canadians. We're going to ensure that we work together to protect Canadians and to move forward. We will get through this together. The Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Well, the Minister talked about working with the provinces, but hours ago the Ontario Health Minister said that that province is no longer expecting delivery of any vaccine in early 2021. Wow. On Friday, the government tabled projections that so showed that 2,000 people roughly per month will die of COVID as we move forward. So in April, will the minister have to stand here and apologize to the families of 8,000 Canadians for the fact that they died because she couldn't roll this vaccine out? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, do you know what will help save Canadians' lives? If the member opposite and the leader of the opposition stop their members from sharing fake and dangerous news like the member from Lethbridge, the member from Carleton will stay focused on saving lives of Canadians instead of spreading conspiracy theories. And in fact, the member from Carolina Nose Hill is focused on keeping us together rather than pitting us apart. Because you know what the virus thrives on, Mr. Speaker? It thrives on us working at opposite ends. We need to work together. We need to stay together. We need to support provinces, territories, and indeed Canadians. Canadians, and that's exactly what this government has done since day one. Honourable member for Calgary, Nose Hill. That, that answer, when Canadians are looking for a plan on when they're going to get a vaccine, will be remembered as desperate political flailing. The question that I asked is one that's on the minds of every Canadian. It's at the heart of the mental health crisis in this country. It's at the heart of jobs loss in this country. It's at the heart of separated families in this country. I ask again, I beg her, when is she going to tell Canadians when they're going to produce a vaccine, give it to Canadians again? Will she have to stand here in April and apologize to the families of 8,000 dead Canadians? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, my heart goes out to Mr. Speaker, I, my heart goes out to all Canadians who have lost a loved one to COVID-19, and our hearts break for them. But I'll tell you what, we are going to continue to work day and night to protect Canadians from contracting COVID-19 and from spreading COVID-19. The vaccines indeed are a light at the end of the tunnel, and we're working across government to make sure that we have access to the vaccines, that we can deploy them. But in the meantime, Mr. Speaker, I call on all Canadians to do everything we can together, because we know that collective action is going to protect our lives. Honorable Deputy de Bo the Honourable Member for Bhopal, Limoilou. Monsieur le Président. Uh, excuse. I'm sorry. Let me just interrupt the Honourable Member. We will restart the clock. Ooh. Monsieur le Président, on croyait qu'il nous restait encore quelques semaines à endurer la Moses de COVID. Les médias nous rapportaient que les pharmaceutiques avaient découvert un vaccin et que la production s'en venait. Janvier, tout au plus. Québec, de son côté, achète déjà des congélateurs pour conserver les doses de vaccins qu'il va recevoir d'Ottawa. Léger problème, le premier ministre a oublié de préciser qu'il n'a encore aucune espèce d'idée quand est-ce qu'on va les avoir. Le premier OK. Est-ce que... Je m'excuse, je vais interrompre encore. Est-ce que la... Ta... Is, the, is the translation working? The interpreter apologizes. There was a technical issue. Je m'excuse. On va voir si la traduction va fonctionner. We will see if the interpretation is working. It should now be working. Do you hear me in English now? Everything's working well. Please go ahead. Mr. Speaker, we thought we only had a few more weeks to endure this horrible pandemic. The media told us that pharma companies had discovered a vaccine and that production was going to start no later than January. Quebec, on its side, is already buying freezers to store the doses promised by Ottawa. There's just one little problem. The Prime Minister forgot to say that he has absolutely no idea when the vaccines will arrive. 
does the Prime Minister realize that it's all very well to reserve vaccines, but we need to know when we're going to get them? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We will be working very hard with Quebec. The fact that Quebec is actually procuring the materials they'll need to store, in particular, the Pfizer vaccine is good news. It means that we are all working together. It means that provinces and territories are working with the federal government on a deployment plan that will ensure that we have what we need in place to, uh, to, to help all Canadians, including Quebecers, get access to these vaccines. The Honourable Deputy de Beauport, Limoilou. The Honourable Member for Beauport, Limoilou. Mr. Speaker, the government of Quebec wrote to the Minister of Health on the 23rd of October to request a vaccine update. Not only did Quebec never get an answer, but one month later, the Prime Minister is vouchsafing to us that there is a little problem. The vaccines won't be here on time. It is not okay. Because Quebec is the province that's going to be vaccinating people, not Ottawa. Quebec is the one that has had to implement lockdown measures, not Ottawa. When are we going to be getting this vaccine? We want a precise date. Honorable Minister. The Honorable Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is excellent cooperation between Ottawa and Quebec. Perhaps my colleague would prefer if we were arguing, but no. We're working to get the necessary freezers and syringes. We're working on procuring the vaccines and distributing them. Why? Because that's the responsible thing to do. And when the vaccines are ready, Canada will be ready. The Honourable Member for Shefford. No, this is not enough, Mr. Speaker. For months, the federal government has been implying that we will be able to start vaccinating the most vulnerable among us. But this week, we learned that that was not true. Mr. Speaker, we've been asking seniors to sacrifice for eight months. We suffered a little less during the summer, but not those over 70. We've been asking them to not go out or see their loved ones for eight months. This is very bad news for them to learn this week that they're not going to get vaccines in Je December or in January. When will they be getting them, Mr. Speaker? They have a right to know. The Honourable Minister. The member opposite uh, doesn't realize that, in fact, Quebec and Canada are working hand in glove to make sure that we're ready to deploy vaccines when they become available. In fact, the officials are working at their level. Ministers of Health meet on a weekly basis, and people are planning. That's exactly why Quebec is moving to procure the kinds of devices they need. And we are also procuring, by the way, devices for provinces and territories. And, Mr. Speaker, we're purchasing the vaccines and we'll deliver them to provinces at no cost. That's true collaboration, Mr. Speaker. We'll be there for the people of Quebec. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, how can we believe what the Minister or this government are saying? That infamous letter that the Minister of Health of Quebec, Christian Dubé, sent to our Minister of Health, there was never an answer. The, the Quebec Minister reported the media that he never heard from the federal government. And now here we're hearing that there is great cooperation between the federal government and Quebec. That's clearly not the case. We can't believe that, given that there's a difference here. Can this minister tell us when she's going to call Christian Dubé? Oh, health minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, Minister Dubé and I have had a conversation. We have spoken. Minister Dubé is a participant on the health minister's meeting, which meets every single week, Mr. Speaker, to confirm the work that our officials are doing together to ensure that we can deploy the vaccine when it arrives and to talk about a number of other pressing measures. I'll be there, Mr. Speaker, for Minister Dubé, as I was for Minister McCann beforehand. We'll continue to be there for the people of Quebec and we'll work hand in glove. The Honourable Member. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can this minister explain to Minister Dubé why, with all the infrastructure in place to vaccinate Quebecers, why the vaccine won't arrive before the three months from now, and even then only a small amount for only a few Quebecers? Why is it that Quebecers and other Canadians, why is it that they'll have to wait nearly a year to get a vaccine? Will the minister tell it to Minister Dubé in their next call? Oh, minister. As the member opposite notes, we have the best vaccine portfolio in the world with the most per capita doses available to Canadians. In fact, three of the promising candidates are under regulatory review right now, expedited review, I might say. Uh, we're working with Americans, we're working the, with the European Union to share data so that we can very quickly review the safety data. And as soon as the vaccines are safe, we'll be deploying them with Quebecers and with all provinces and territories.
The Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. Australian Airlines Qantas declared this week that international travellers will be required to prove they have been vaccinated against COVID-19 before they are permitted to fly. If other airlines follow suit, thousands of Canadian families will continue to be separated from their loved ones abroad, while other countries with vaccines like the US and the UK are able to get back to normal. The Liberals have no rollout plan for vaccine distribution. Canadians are completely in the dark about this. Now Canadians could be locked out of international travel because of Liberal mismanagement. Simple question, what is the date that vaccines will be available to Canadians? The date. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I've told the member opposite and in fact the, uh, the House, in fact Canada has one of the best portfolios in the world with seven promising candidates. Mr. Speaker, more doses per capita than any other country. Three of the promising uh, candidates under regulatory review, Mr. Speaker, and a deployment plan that is uh, being built with provinces and territories who, by the way, have expertise in immunization and are trusted partners in delivering on their responsibilities in health care. And Mr. Speaker, we will be there together to get Canadians through this. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, and I would encourage the members opposite to be on Team Canada. The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. On August 31, the Prime Minister said the National Research Council would be able to produce hundreds of thousands of vaccine doses starting in November and millions by the end of this year. Now, not 90 days later, he says Canada has no capacity to produce vaccines at all. Health officials also confirmed this government failed to negotiate the right to produce vaccines in Canada as other countries have done. This means Canadians will have to wait for vaccines. Can the Prime Minister explain his blatant reversal and why he didn't negotiate the right to produce vaccines in Canada? Well, Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think that Canadians understand that before this pandemic began, Canada had no biomanufacturing cap capacity that was suitable for a COVID-19 vaccine. And we're not going to be taking lessons from the opposition on this, certainly not from the Conservatives, because it was them who sold out our industry at the time. The fabled crown jewel, Connaught Laboratories, in the 1980s went bye-bye, and so did so many others. It's because of these problems, even through the 2000s, where, where investments in the life sciences were taken away from ISAID. We've had to recover territory over time and these investments that we are making right now are only going to help as we bring forward our vaccine portfolio to the benefit of all Canadians. Well, member for London Fanshawe. Mr. Speaker, we are in the middle of the COVID-19 second wave. Young people across the country are once again feeling the brunt of its economic impacts. New Democrats successfully passed a motion this week calling on the government to re-establish a moratorium on interest on student loans. This will help struggling students who are facing economic hardships. When will this government introduce that moratorium? When will this government provide the support student needs, students need, and when will they turn their words into action? Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Throughout the pandemic, we've put in place significant measures to support students, and our government will continue to make significant investments in students and in young Canadians. To help students get through this difficult time, we've put in place a six-month moratorium on student loan payments, helping over a million young Canadians. For students who began resuming their repayment, we put in place measures to help them with their loans. Under the Repayment Assistance Plan, borrowers only pay what they can afford and only start repaying their loan when they earn at least $25,000 per year. We've also doubled Canada student grants and will continue to be there for students, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, Sea to Sky Country. Mr. Speaker, since the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic, our government has been there to support Canadian workers. More recently, we've transitioned from emergency supports to a more flexible EI system uh, and a suite of recovery benefits for Canadians that are not eligible for EI um, and are, are sick, are self-isolating, or need to provide care for a child, family member, or dependent. Uh, now that we're in the midst of the second wave, some jurisdictions have already announced an extended winter break for students to curb the spread of COVID-19. Can, can the minister confirm that parents who cannot work because they must care for their child or a family member will be supported through the Canada Recovery Caregiving Benefit? Thank you. Oh, minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, Sea to Sky Country for his important question. The answer is yes. In situations where schools are closed for an extended period of time due to COVID-19, workers who have to take care of a child under the age of 12 or a family member who needs supervised care would, of course, be able to receive the Canada Recovery Caregiving Benefit. This is there to support workers, Mr. Speaker, $500 a week for 26 weeks. We will be there for parents, we are there for workers, and we'll continue to be there for Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, tempers are flaring in the Commons today because we're in the second wave of a pandemic. People are getting sick, 
businesses are struggling, and Canadians are seeing millions of citizens of other countries getting vaccines in the coming days and weeks, and this government won't even answer a question on when we will see them in Canada. They talk about a Team Canada approach, but let's remember, Mr. Speaker, when we asked in January about flights from China, they called us intolerant. When we asked about masks, they said masks weren't important. When we pushed for rapid tests, they blamed the provinces. Now we ask about reviews, uh, vaccines, they say we're reviewing, not receiving. When are Canadians going to see the first vaccine? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our main goal is to get safe and effective vaccines to every Canadian. We are currently in line with Japan, New Zealand, Australia and the EU for vaccine delivery. And in fact, we have secured a contract with Moderna, one of the most promising candidates, while the UK only secured its agreement last week. We have the most diverse portfolio in the world, Mr. Speaker. We are working very closely with Health Canada in terms of the regulatory process. And when a vaccine is ready, we will be ready too. The Honourable Member for Wellington Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, once again, the government's message on China is confusing. The minister was at committee this week and delivered two contradictory messages. The Canadian press reported the government has already put in place a new framework on China, while the National Post reported that the government has not put in place a new framework. If we can't figure it out and the media can't figure it out, then how on earth is China or anyone else supposed to figure it out? To be effective, Canada must act in a rational and predictable way. The Liberal policy on China is anything but that. When will this government get its act together and develop a clear, coherent policy on China? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to answer this question again. I think the member asked me that question, and I'm sure he listened to me when I testified. Mr. Speaker, it's very simple. We're going to be firm and smart. We have been firm and smart when it comes to asking the release of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor and obtaining consular access. We have been firm and smart when it comes to the Uyghur and asking China to uphold their human rights international obligations. We have been firm and smart when it comes to Hong Kong, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue to be firm and smart. That's Canadian policy when it comes to China, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. M- Mr. Speaker, what a ridiculous response. Firm and smart seems to mean doing absolutely nothing, and maybe on a good day sending thoughts and prayers to the victims of the regime. Mr. Speaker, on the issue of foreign interference and elite capture, John McCallum told us at committee that he cannot divulge the names of clients, but if the government were to bring in a foreign agent's registry, he would find a way to do that. So I want to ask the government to do John McCallum a favor and give him the opportunity to disclose the names of his clients by bringing in a foreign agent's registry. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I said at the committee, reports of harassment and intimidation of individuals in Canada are deeply troubling, and allegations of such acts, Mr. Speaker, are being carried out by foreign agents are taken very, very seriously. Chinese government representative in Canada, like all foreign government representative in Canada, have a duty under international law to respect the laws and regulations of Canada. Mr. Speaker, as we've said, the safety and security of Canadians is paramount. We will take all appropriate measures to protect their safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. This Liberal government is lagging behind our trusted allies and being soft on China and and failing to stand up for pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong. The limited Liberal Economic Immigration Program for Hong Kong excludes pro-democracy activists like 24-year-old Joshua Wong, who is facing a five-year prison sentence for unlawful assembly, which is an equivalent crime in Canada. However, it is widely understood that these prison sentences and charges on pro-democracy activists are politically motivated and influenced by the Communist Party of China. Will pro-democracy activists like Joshua be barred from entry into Canada, yes or no? The Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, to suggest that Canada has not been tough when it comes to Hong Kong, Mr. Speaker, does not bear with any fact, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. In fact, Canada was the very first country in the world to suspend our extradition treaty, to suspend the export of sensitive equipment, to impose new measures when it comes to traveling, and also, Mr. Speaker, to, to introduce a set of immigration measures which are complementary with our five eyes, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to be at the forefront of the response. We will continue to be firm and smart when it comes to responding to the imposition of national security law in Hong Kong, Mr. Speaker. Le député de la... The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Mr. Speaker, it was Premier Night in the House of Commons yesterday. Four hours of emergency debate on the status of French in Montreal. A first for the federal level. Four hours of lovely speeches on the importance of the language of Quebec. But do you know how many concrete measures were proposed by the Liberals? Zero. None. Mr. Speaker, French must be the common language of all Quebecers and the language of work for all Quebecers. That's why the Bloc is proposing two bills. Why is the government unable to say that they will support us? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree with my colleague that we had a, a great evening last night. We showed all showed our love for the French language, and it was very inspiring. And I think we're sending the right message out to Quebecers and Canadians. As you know, the Bloc Québécois is trying to use a confrontational strategy to uh, present a situation where there's an enemy. And, but in reality, we all agree. We agree with the fact that we need to protect the French fact in Quebec and across the country, and we're going to work together so that we can achieve that. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Well, that's the problem. Mr. Speaker, everyone's making speeches about the importance of French, but who wants to take action? We have to send out a strong message. In Quebec, things happen in French. That's why we must make adequate knowledge of French a condition for citizenship. It's our common language. That's why we must apply a Bill 101 to companies under federal jurisdiction. It's a language of work. These are two historical and concrete positions of the bloc. Will the Liberals finally take action to counter the decline of French in Montreal. Uh, Ministre. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is, who can take action in this House to uh, deal with the decline of French uh, across uh, Quebec and in Canada? And the reality is that we are here and we are going to take action. So I just wanted to reassure my colleague opposite. But of course, we are going to do so properly in conjunction with Quebecers, Canadians, and all Francophones across the country, because this is a very important issue, and we have a, a historic opportunity to do so. At Health Committee, Dr. Tam admitted, because of a lack of access to testing and delays in results, the COVID app is not effective. In fact, only 5% of Ontario coronavirus cases use the COVID Alert app to report their infection. Clearly, the $10 million Liberal COVID app is not the silver bullet. To ensure the app is effective, Dr. Tam said, absolutely, access and rapid turnaround is important. When will the health minister provide Dr. Tam the tools she needs? When will she ensure and provide rapid and home-based testing to all Canadians? Honourable Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think the member opposite is slightly confused about who provides testing in this country. In fact, Canada does not provide the testing, and it is solely within the jurisdiction of uh, provinces and territories who have the responsibility for health care to Canadians. But here's what we are providing, Mr. Speaker. We are providing the tools to provinces and territories that they need. Well over 5 million tests since the beginning of October, rapid ones to provinces and territories, the personal protective equipment, procurement, a uh, variety of other tools and, and uh, medical devices that provinces and territories need. We're going to continue to be there. And in terms of the COVID Alert app, I would encourage all members to download it, to encourage the members in their constituencies to download the app. Uh, certainly, the more Canadians that use it, the more useful it will be. The Honourable Member for Regina Louvain. CBC recently reported that NAV Canada is considering closing the Air Traffic Control Centre at the Regina International Airport. This plan would reduce safety, reduce flights, and reduce the economic recovery in our home province. 
My question is simple to the Minister of Transport. Will, the pro will you provide NAV Canada with the funding needed to keep the air traffic control tower open, or will you continue with this mean-spirited cut to our province? Why do these Liberals treat Western Canadians as second-class citizens all the time? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to reassure my colleague that uh, when NAVCAN uh, does an examination of service needs across the country, it does so with safety in mind. And I also want to reassure him that Transport Canada will also be examining any proposed plans. The reality, of course, is that the number of aircraft in the air has uh, diminished drastically in the past few months, and uh, a, an organization like NAVCAN has a responsibility to make sure that it uh, has the proper service level needs, and that's exactly what it's doing at this time. Well, member for Regina, Wascana. Mr. Speaker, various news outlets are reporting that NAV Canada is planning to shut down the air traffic control towers at airports in Regina, Windsor, Prince George, Whitehorse, Fort McMurray, and Sault Ste. Marie. Air traffic control towers provide vital, real-time information to pilots about weather conditions and runway traffic, the loss of which would put the safety of Canadians at risk. Will the government commit today that there will be no closures of air traffic control towers? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, NAVCAN is our air traffic controller and has a worldwide reputation for safety. In fact, an enviable record of safety. As uh, my honourable colleague will probably know, about the two-thirds of the number of aircraft that were flying in 2019 are no, are no longer uh, able to fly because of the COVID pandemic. So the number of aircraft in the air has been considerably reduced, and NAVCAN has a responsibility to evaluate the service level needs across the country, and Transport Canada will be there to oversee it. Thank you. The Honourable Deputy. The Honourable Member for Bourassa. Mr. Speaker. This week, the government issued calls for proposals for three programs. The Black Community Entrepreneurship Program, the Community Multiculturalism and Anti-Racism Support Program, and the Program Initiative to Support Black Communities in Canada. I'm happy to see the government taking these measures to help black communities, in particular, to fight discrimination. Can the Minister for Small Businesses tell us about the importance of these programs? The Minister. The Honourable Minister. Monsieur le Président, les Mr. Speaker, black entrepreneurs make an important contribution to our communities and to the economy in Canada. This week, I announced the launch of two of the three uh, pillars of this first ever program in the country. Applications are now open. We recognize that systemic racism also exists in the business world and that we need to combat it. We are proud to implement these important programs. Member for Calgary Centre. $16 billion. That's the amount that Canadians didn't receive last year as a result of the discount for our most valuable export product, Canadian oil. This is the result of bad decisions and a constrained pipeline infrastructure to deliver environmentally produced Canadian oil to key markets. Can the government tell this House its plans to coordinate with the new U.S. administration so that long-planned and existing pipelines can provide the most environmental solution to U.S. refineries? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, in the past years, We've approved line three, 7,000 jobs created. Keystone Excel, our support is unwavering, 1,500 jobs created. LNG Canada, we're building it, thousands of jobs. TMX, TMX we got it approved, we're getting it built, 5,600 jobs created so far. NGTL 2021, we approved it, thousands of jobs. Orphan and inactive wells, $1.7 investments, thousands of jobs created. The wage subsidy, more than 60 resource workers on the job in the pandemic. That's our record, Mr. Speaker, of supporting the oil and gas workers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Fort McMurray, Cold Lake. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister strongly hinted he will block the proposed Fort McMurray to Alaska Rail. The Alaska to Alberta Rail Trade Corridor will create new markets for Canadian products, including oil and gas. Stop, stop, stop. 
I'm going to interrupt the honourable member and ask him to start over. Uh, someone has their microphone on uh, uh, remotely. I would ask everyone to mute their mic if they're not asking or answering a question. Very good. The honourable member for Fort McMurray, Cold Lake, please start over. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister strongly hinted he will block the proposed Fort McMurray to Alaska Rail. The Alaska to Alberta Rail Trade Corridor will create new markets for Canadian products, including oil and gas, mineral extraction, agriculture, and food security in the north. Does the Minister of Infrastructure agree with the Prime Minister's musings on the ATA Rail proposal? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, um, we have not yet received an application and we cannot review an application that we don't have. So this government uh, supports the good projects and we know they only get built after they've gone through a fair and thorough review process. That's how we're going to prove TMX and the line through replacement pipeline, creating thousands of jobs. Merci, Monsieur le Président. The Honourable Member for West Nova. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's been seven months since the worst mass murder in Canadian history sadly took place in our province of Nova Scotia. The families of victims continue to call for information into this tragic event. The report of the inquiry is only due in 2022, and in the meantime, families are having to fight and beg this government for answers. Mr. Speaker, this week marks the 15th Federal Victims of Survivors of Crime Week. Will the Minister of Public Safety commit to provide an update to the families before Christmas and respect their right to information as protected by the Canadian Victims Bill of Rights? Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Mr. S Mr. S Mr. Speaker. We will continue to take steps towards creating a criminal justice uh, system that treats victims and survivors of crime with courtesy, compassion, and respect. This includes the ongoing implementation of the Canadian Victims Bill of Rights at the federal, provincial, and territorial levels. Through the Victims Fund, Mr. Speaker, we have made more than $28 million available to provincial and territorial governments and non-governmental organizations to increase awareness and knowledge of victims' issues, legislation, services available. Mr. Speaker, it's by working collaboratively at all levels of government that we can continue to empower the resilience of victims and survivors and ensure that their voices are heard. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Louis. Natural disasters are increasing in frequency and severity. Flooding continues to be the most costly natural disaster in Canada, causing over $1 billion in direct damage each year. Water damage goes beyond the destruction of property. It also places an emotional toll on individuals as their homes are destroyed and families are displaced. Can the Minister of Public Safety update this House on what the government is doing to help Canadians reduce their financial and physical vulnerability to flooding? The Honourable Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Lac Saint Louis for this very important question. And as he quite accurately has pointed out, flooding is the most frequent and costly nat natural disaster in Canada. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, this week we announced the creation of an interdisciplinary task force on flood insurance and relocation. The task force will examine options to protect homeowners who are at high risk of flooding and examine the viability of a low cost national flood insurance program. It will also consider options for potential relocation for residents of areas at the highest risk. And together, Mr. Speaker, we will work to prevent and mitigate the impacts of floods for all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Mountain. Mr. Speaker, millions of Canadians are struggling to pay their bills and put food on the table. The pandemic has only made this problem worse, and many people are facing job uncertainty. The Prime Minister promised by the end of 2020, he'd bring fairness to workplaces across Canada but continues to side with big business and to betray workers. Canadians deserve to earn a fair wage for the work that they do. Will the government commit to its promise and helping hundreds of workers by working of workers by implementing a $15 federal minimum wage now? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for that question. And uh, I agree that hard work deserves a decent wage. We know that good quality jobs are a driver of a strong economy, along with people being compensated appropriately. 
A $15 federal minimum wage is a commitment we made during the campaign, as well as one that was reaffirmed in my mandate letter. My priority through this pandemic, of course, has been the health and safety of workers across this country. We know a successful restart depends on a safe restart. However, I look forward to moving forward on this commitment and also look forward to the member's support. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A beacon of hope we are holding on to during the pandemic and, and under the threat of the climate crisis is our confidence in the next generation to be innovative and implement solutions to repair the world they inherit from us. However, we are not adequately providing them the tools and support they need to achieve this aim. The average student loan debt in New Brunswick is $40,000, significantly higher than the national average. How are they supposed to be able to build back better if they start their career in adult life with such a burden on their shoulders? Mr. Speaker, students deserve more than a failed summer program and having to pay their loan while facing such devastating socioeconomic uncertainties. What is this government doing now in a concrete way to support students through this? And at the very least, is the minister in support of suspending the collection of interest? Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's really important that we have um, issues facing youth be raised in this House of Commons. And that's exactly why the Prime Minister ensured that there was a full voice at the Cabinet table, because young people are not only the leaders of tomorrow, they are the leaders of today. And that's why, when it came to our response for the pandemic, we put forward a $9 billion suite of programs. Students will not be left behind. Youth will not be left behind. They are part of the decision-making table. We will continue to raise the right voices. And right now, we have the State of the Youth report being written. And I encourage young people to get involved, because having their say is instrumental as the way we build back even better and consciously more inclusive. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.